Welcome to the Backlash at Backlash.com. My name is Rod Van Mecklen, and in this video I'm going to read from my 1992 article, Double Sexual Standards of Feminism, the footnoted version of which is linked below. 1992, Bellevue, Washington. The goal of first wave feminism was not to oppress men, but to open the doors for women to pursue their own dreams and fulfill their own destinies. In this agenda, there is no imperative to judge men by women's standards, but unfortunately, that changed a lot, often. Throughout the more than 200-year history of feminism, moralists tried to subvert the movement to their own ends. More than 75 years ago, well, let's see, that was written 23 years ago, so it's 98 years, um, almost 100 years ago, for example, they delayed female suffrage by using the women's movement to promote prohibition and the abolition of prostitution. Consequently, men otherwise inclined to recognize women's rights to vote resisted. Well, duh. Of course, feminists say, ooh, sexist, male chauvinism, hogwash. Read Ray Tannehill's book, Sex and History. I keep coming back to that book. It's a great book, and it just... Uh, she doesn't set out to destroy feminism. She just does it. The second wave feminists of 23 years ago, when I wrote this, and the third wave feminists of today are no different. They are still trying to, well, they've largely succeeded in subverting the women's movement to promote their own ends. Never before have they held so much power over America's social, political, and legal agenda as they do now. And of course that extends to, golly, all the West. Um, India is now getting caught up in this. Heaven help us. Wherever men turn, we are judged by a standard that excuses in women what it condemns in men. This is especially evident in the adoption of the reasonable woman standard courts now use to determine whether men have sexually harassed women. When a man does it, it's sexual harassment. But when a woman does it, cultural symbols preclude the possibility her male victims could have actually felt harassed. I forget which feminist I took that verbiage from, but that was their claim that, well, men can't feel sexually harassed because of cultural symbols probably Catherine McKinnon or maybe Cher Height. In other words, it's okay for women, but not for men. This is a double standard, not because men are judged by it, but because women are not. Ironically, when women are judged by any standard, even if men are judged by the same standard, feminists call that a double standard. If men choose not to have sex with promiscuous women, for example, then it's a double standard, even if they also choose not to have sex with promiscuous men, which, of course, most of us wouldn't have sex with promiscuous men, I mean, or even not promiscuous men. Never mind. Oh, gosh. What? Now probably I'll get accused of being a homophobe. Well, whatever. Now you know why they claim MGTOW are sexist. The real reason, of course, is that we interfere with their political agenda. The Philandrous Princess. Feminists today believe female sluts should be able to sleep with male sluts and still be treated like princesses in the morning. Men who won't have sex with women who sleep around are, they say, perpetuating a sexist double standard if they will continue to be friends with men who sleep around. Having the option to engage in sex without the moral stigma once imposed upon it may be a good thing, but according to second wave feminist Cher Height, the sexual double standard against women still persists. Quote, if you met a woman you liked and wanted to date, but then found out she had had sex with 10 to 20 men during the preceding year, would you still like her and take her seriously? Most men were quite doubtful they could could take her seriously, only 35% said they could, close quote. For decades, feminists have said men who are interested in only one thing are sexist pigs. Do they now expect us to believe that a woman who is interested in only one thing is somehow not a sexist pig, or given the gender a sexist sow, simply because of her gender? That's a feminist double standard. If a man's male friend is sleeping around, most men won't stop taking him seriously. Isn't that indicative of a male double standard? No! 
Men continue to take their promiscuous male friend seriously, not because of a sexist double standard, but because the context is not sex, but friendship. If the men height surveyed said they would stop taking a platonic female friend seriously if they found out she was promiscuous, but that they would continue to take a promiscuous male friend seriously, that could indicate a sexist double standard because the context is the same in both cases. Or, if she surveyed bisexual men who said they would not have sex with promiscuous women but would have sex with promiscuous men, then again, that would almost certainly indicate a sexist double standard. Moreover, all a woman needs to do to have sex with lots of men is to wait until she's asked, and then say yes. Well, for a man to have sex with lots of women, he has to ask and be rejected by many women. So, for women to have many partners is no accomplishment, but for men to have many partners is quite an accomplishment. So, while we may not respect the morals of a promiscuous man in the same way that we wouldn't respect the savagery of a man like the character Khan in Star Trek, we may nonetheless respect men of both kinds for their extreme masculinity. Hence, the only legitimate way to test for a sexist double standard is within a single context. Instead, feminists rely on a sexist double standard of their own, confusing the context to prov prove male sexism where none may really exist. That's all for now. Check out the other videos, subscribe to the channel. For the Backlash at Backlash.com, my name is Rod Van Mecklen.